That row is missing. Uh, all right, well, it's time. Let's get started. Our ranks are thinning a little bit. Probably people are home studying for Monday's exam. That's probably it. Uh, so, just a reminder, I that didn't my marker didn't show up very well over there. So, I wrote it up here again. But so, Sam 2, Monday covers our, our eukaryotes, chapter five. So that's like the protozoa and the fungi primarily. Uh, chapter seven, uh, a lot of terminology about growth, uh, describing growth. That uh, chapter eight was just a kind of a biochemical review that I didn't lecture on, but remember there are a few questions in 8.1 and 8.2 only, uh, just because I wanted you to kind of look over those sections in the book. Um, uh, not 8.3 and 8.4. I think 8.3 was lipids and 8.4 was proteins. Uh, so just 8.1 and 8.2. Uh, and then 9 is metabolism. 10 and 11 are genetics. So we're going to finish that up today. Um, I know it's, it's a lot. Uh, the good news is that the weather's supposed to be bad the next few days. So uh, hopefully get started on your studying. Uh, I would encourage you to start that homework um, kind of kind of a lot for 10 and 11, I guess. So I would do that maybe in the next few days. Don't save that till Sunday night. Uh, then you'll rush through it and you won't get as much value out of it. So uh, do that now once once we get finished. Uh, I wanted to start with a couple of practice questions. Question first. Yeah. Do you know me? Ah, so yes, more than the first one. So I think it's 66 questions, but you'll have the full hour and 15 minutes. Um, I don't, I don't think you will be rushed. Yes. No, they're not the 8.1 and 8.2 are not in the learning objectives. It's just sort of, Hey, I expect that, you know, this stuff from other classes, like what are the macromolecules and just, uh, it's it's in the it's in the OpenStax textbook above it. So, uh, yeah. So I didn't lecture on it, and it's not any notes about it, but it is in the textbook. Okay. All right. So yeah, make sure that that is showing up for you. Uh, every once in a while, I have a student say to me like, "Well, that's not in the textbook," and I'll say, "Yeah, it is. It's right there." And for some reason, it's not loading correctly. So sometimes just restarting your computer can can fix that, but you don't always know if you're missing something or right? <laughs> if it's not there then. Uh, so we've had a few issues with that, but I don't think widespread. Uh, so I know this figure didn't, it's not terribly clear here. I wish I would have like thought to post this, but I just kind of came up with it today. So few few questions here. Um, it, it, hopefully you've been kind of staring at this in the last couple of minutes, but I'll give you a minute to answer these, what, what process is being described? Um, hopefully that's an easy one. Uh, label what each of those enzymes are, enzyme A, B, and C. And then if you could write in or think about, I know you don't have this, uh, think about the directionality uh, of each strand. So, you know, what direction is this? What direction is this end? That sort of thing. Okay, so just take a second and look at that if you haven't already.
All right, let's let's talk through this. So what process is this? It's, it's replication, okay? Because both strands are, are being copied here. If, if it was transcription, only one or the other would be, uh, would you be making a new strand of, of something? You can't tell from this whether it's DNA or RNA, but, but definitely this is DNA because it's double-stranded, right? Um, it's being unzipped by, by this enzyme here, enzyme A. Okay, so that unzipping enzyme, or um, sometimes we refer to that as melting the two DNA strands, that's helicase. Um, enzyme B here, that's uh, shown here and here, that's DNA polymerase three. That's the main enzyme that's doing the work there, replication. Uh, what about C? What do you think C is? What enzyme is that signifying? It's a little hard to tell, um, but what I think this enzyme is doing is, is getting rid of some primer and filling in that RNA primer with a short segment of DNA. Okay, so that's going to be DNA polymerase one. Uh, and then some ligase would need to come in and add a phosphate and a phosphodiester bond to kind of seal up the ends. Directionality of each strand. So let me just erase what I, there we go. So it, here we go, this strand right here, it's, it's always adding on to the three prime end. So you know that strand, uh, that is incidentally the leading strand in this case. Sometimes we've, and before we drew the lagging strand on the bottom and the leading strand on top. Uh, but here, uh, and then this, this strand, this would be the three prime end of this strand. Uh, and you would have uh, another, it'd be here first and then the next one towards the replication fork. Uh, so if this is three prime right here, then this old strand right here, it's going to be anti-parallel, so that's going to be five prime. Okay, so uh, let's see. Three. Whoops. Nope. Nope. I did that wrong. <laughs> I'm sure. So this is the three prime end, five prime end. So this is the three prime end of the old strand. Sorry about that. Goof myself up. Okay, so here three prime, five prime. Uh, this this is going to be. Whoops. Let's see. I. It's hard to think and talk at the same time. Uh, that's going to be the five prime of that old strand. Okay, so yes. Ah, okay, so the difference between DNA polymerase three and DNA polymerase one. Uh, so there, there's actually five different DNA polymerases. We're going to mention another one today, just kind of briefly. But uh, it, it, apparently DNA polymerase three, that's just the main enzyme that does the lion's share of the replicating. DNA polymerase one is just uh, replacing the primers. Okay, those RNA primers, uh, primase is the enzyme that sticks those primers in because DNA polymerase three needs something to start from. Okay, I don't know. Does that answer your question good enough? Hopefully, okay. Uh, so it, yeah, with, with nucleotides, not ribonucleotides, right? Another question. Um, how do we know it's a three prime? Uh, so like right here, yeah. because it's, it has to have, uh, well, let me again, replace my uh, drawing here. So we've got the arrow here. We know it's going in this direction. So that means the new nucleotides are adding on right there. And they are always going to add on to their, there's a hydroxyl group there, a three prime hydroxyl group. Okay, so all the new nucleotides are always adding on to that three prime end. Okay, the five prime end has, has a phosphate uh, on the end of it there. Okay, so you got to work back from there. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, Good, so one more question about, I don't know why that came out kind of blurry, okay. Uh, oh, there we go, okay. So this is from uh, near the end of last lecture. 
recognize that term Shine Del Garno sequence? Where do we find that? All right, I heard somebody say translation. Yes, you're on the right track. <laughs> okay, um, it is actually the sequence on the messenger RNA that lines up precisely with the 16S ribosomal RNA of the small subunit. Okay, so there is a RNA binding site on, on the small subunit of the messenger RNA that lines up exactly with the Shine Del Garno sequence uh, sorry, there is a messenger RNA binding site on the ribosome that, that lines up exactly with the Shine Del Garno sequence of the messenger RNA that's being translated at the ribosome. Okay. All right, so uh, let's, let's finish up uh, where we were talking about last time. Any other questions? Okay, I did post some practice questions, 12 practice questions um, under exam objectives and practice questions. So make sure you take a look at those as well as the answers. Okay, uh, where we finished up last time, we were talking about uh, mutagens. So we talked about some uh, different causes of mutation, radiation, both ionizing and non-ionizing uh, radiation, as well as just a few examples of chemical mutagens. Uh, you don't need to worry about these examples. Um, they were all nucleoside analogs, which just means that they are similar in structure to the base and the sugar of, of DNA. So they're similar enough that uh, they can get incorporated into DNA, especially by viruses. Um, our next unit that we'll get to today, we're gonna to start talking about viruses, but they're usually a little bit more indiscriminate. Uh, they don't, they're not as careful about making mistakes when they will replicate their DNA or RNA. So any kind of analog could easier, more easily get incorporated into their nucleic acid. So that's why I mentioned some of these drugs like AZT or molnupiravir, a newer one that uh, can help us kind of slow down viral replication. But those are just examples. Uh, again, nothing specific there. Um, another, oh, and so that leads us into, well, what if when a, when a mistake is made um, in a cell's replication or transcription, um, typically cells have ways to fix that. Uh, now, sometimes those fixing mechanisms are overwhelmed, but we talked about how DNA polymerase three has a really good proofreading mechanism. It goes super fast. And even though it goes so fast, it has a way to kind of look behind it and make sure it didn't incorporate the wrong base, like a base that's not complementary to the template. Um, three other repair mechanisms that I want to talk about, uh, mismatch repair. So this is a re repair mechanism, uh, again, that uh, I'm talking specifically about bacteria here. Um, we, we have some repair mechanisms that are similar as well to some of these, uh, but uh, this is a, a type of repair that relies on that methylation. So we said that once DNA gets replicated, eventually uh, for bacteria, some of the adenines get methylated. So here is, uh, let, me, let me come back to this slide, but let me show you um, how that can play. So uh, here we have two strands uh, of DNA that you can see the replication fork opening and the lines in red are, is the new DNA that's being, that's being made. Um, here you can see this ME, that's, that's a methyl group, that's, in other words, a CH3 group that's attached to the adenine there of that old strand of DNA. So let's say the new strand, you can see right here, a thymine, and it covers up, oops, the thymine has been uh, nucleotide uh, 
or the thymine base is put in there instead of you would expect cytosine to be uh, complementary to that guanine that was there. So there are enzymes that will move down the new strand and see if there's any of these mismatches that have taken place and it will fix them. The question is, how do these enzymes know which one is right and which one is wrong? Well, uh, it's, those enzymes are going to fix the strand that is not methylated yet. Okay, that's how it, these enzymes, uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to worry about the name of those enzymes, but they used to be called DAM enzymes for DNA methylation uh, enzymes. I don't know if they still call them that or not. <laughs> um, but so they'll, they'll go down and uh, fix the strand here, in the, in, right here, that the reds, the new strand hasn't been methylated yet. Uh, and so it fixes a strand that's not been methylated, assuming that's the new one, assumes that the old strand is correct. Okay, so uh, eventually then uh, enzymes go down and methylate the new strand as well. And then those repair mechanism, this repair mechanism wouldn't, wouldn't work anymore. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a, couple, a couple of ways that thymine dimers can be fixed. So remember, the thymine dimers, those are a particular kind of mutation that's caused by uh, non-ionizing radiation or ultraviolet light. Uh, so this is a figure from your book. Okay, here's, here's the UV light uh, hitting the cell and it causes this, uh, this dimer to form two thymines on one strand binding to each other. There's a couple of different ways that this can be fixed. Bacteria can make this enzyme, I'm just gonna write this a little bit bigger, photolyase. Okay, that, that is an enzyme that moves down the newly uh, synthesized uh, DNA strands. Uh, it's a process uh, known as photoreactivation because this, this enzyme photolyase uh, is activated by visible light. And so basically the energy for that enzyme to work uh, comes from visible light. So that's not something that we can do somewhere uh, apparently uh, in our evolutionary development, we lost the ability to be able to do that. But thymine dimers are a really common mutation because again, there's ultraviolet light, sunlight. Uh, so it's a really common mutation. All right, so here's an enzyme that basically the, the green bubble there is supposed to symbolize the enzyme. Uh, basically it breaks that bond between, between those thymine dimers and restores the DNA uh, to its kind of normal shape so that it can be replicated or transcribed properly. Uh, the other mechanism that's quite common is called nucleotide excision repair. Uh, sometimes we call this dark repair. Uh, because it doesn't require light. Okay. It can happen in the light as well, invisible light, but it doesn't need it. So sometimes we call this over here light repair because it, it needs light. Okay, so either nucleotide excision repair or dark repair. Uh, but basically this involves a bunch of different enzymes uh, there is some nucleases that cut the strand here and here and excise that, that problem area. This says that there's some helicase, right? That would, that would cut those hydrogen bonds there between the two strands. And then DNA polymerase one and DNA ligase will synthesize a, a new segment there. Okay, so, okay, a couple different repair mechanisms. Uh, there's one other that we know happens in E. coli, uh, probably in other bacteria as well, but it's called error-prone repair. Uh, so sometimes we said that in the case of ionizing radiation, it can cause both strands of the DNA to break. And that's a huge problem because then there's no template 
to try to fix it from. Uh, but there are mechanisms like this SOS response where uh, enzymes like uh, DNA polymerase four and DNA polymerase five basically will throw up new bases and polymerize them without any regard to any kind of template. So it's kind of the Hail Mary or the half court shot before the buzzer. Uh, just to, you know, it's not likely going to be the right basis that are going to encode some kind of usable protein, but there's a chance that maybe the organism will, will still survive. So uh, it's, it's, again, sloppy, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it may work. Okay. So, um, like I said, there's lots of different DNA polymerase enzymes, and we've, we've talked about a few of them. All right, so our last topic here, uh, I want to talk a little bit. We, mutation is one way that genetic diversity can be introduced. You know, uh, usually bacteria, when they uh, replicate by binary fission, it's just, you know, two daughter cells that are essentially clones of that parent cell. So how can there ever be any uh, change uh, that for, for the good of, of the bacteria? Uh, well, there's three different kinds of ways that bacteria uh, or prokaryotes, I should say, uh, can, can share their DNA. Uh, so we don't do this in humans, uh, but this, these are, again, uh, for prokaryotes. Uh, and horizontal gene transfer. So that refers to sharing genes between cells that are kind of in the same generation. Vertical gene transfer would be like the parent cell and then it splits into two daughter cells, okay, like a second generation. So horizontal genes, same generation. Uh, and we've referred, uh, sorry, horizontal transfer, same generation. We, we've referred to a few of these uh, already. Uh, we'll go into a few more details. We talked about transformation and Griffith's famous experiment. I'm going to hit the highlights of, of that uh, one more time again. But that's just where a cell will, will take up some DNA from the environment and then incorporate it into its genome. Uh, transduction, we have not talked about this yet. This is, this is the kind that involves a virus. So there are viruses that will only infect bacteria cells. We call them bacteriophage. Uh, and if a cell is infected with a virus, um, that virus can potentially take some DNA from another bacteria cell and include it into uh, another cell. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, and then conjugation, this involves cells that are able to extend a P-list to another cell. Okay, so uh, let's look at all three of those. And rather br briefly, uh, this is just another graphic of Griffith's famous 1928 experiment that showed that transformation can take place. Uh, I like this one a little bit better than the other one that I showed. Uh, but uh, the highlights here, remember there's a couple of different strains of the strep pneumonia bacteria, one strain, the wild type strain makes a really nice capsule around it. When you inject mice with that wild type strain, they die, they get a really nasty pneumonia. Uh, and there's a mutant strain that's not able to make a capsule. Okay, because that organism can't make a, ca make a capsule when you inject it into mice, it doesn't have any effect on them. It doesn't establish an infection. Okay, so what he did, he took the living strain R and mixed it up with some heat killed strain S, um, which both of those separately wouldn't kill the mice, but he found that in fact the mice died and then he was able to isolate some living strain S from, from what he cultured from that dead mouse. Okay, so there was uh, DNA from that dead uh, capsule producing strain that was able to leave those cells when the cell dies, the cell wall breaks up a little bit, was able to leave those cells and enter the living strain R and give that strain R the ability now to make a capsule again. 
Uh, and he found that he could do that this in the lab as well. He didn't need a living organism. He could do this in a test tube. Um, and it, there's not a lot of cells that you're able to transform this way unless you artificially make them able to be transformed. Um, we call cells uh, competent. Um, so let's see, I'm write that somewhere. Competent uh, cells are, are able to take up DNA. Uh, from their environment. It's not clear like how they actually transport the DNA into their cell because it seems like it'd be a pretty big molecule. Um, but we can make cells competent sometimes in the lab if we treat cells with salts and heat and do some special things to them, we can make them more likely to take up another cell's DNA. Okay, but we think that this probably doesn't happen that much in nature. It's probably pretty rare. Uh, probably transduction is pretty rare in nature as well. Uh, we may actually, we're gonna talk, start talking about viruses today. We may get to uh, viral reproduction a little bit today, uh, but there are a couple different ways that viruses reproduce. Um, and one, in one way, they are actually able to integrate their, their nucleic acid in with their host cell. So in this case, we see uh, a bacteriophage. That's a virus that specifically infects bacterial cells. Um, typically, once they inject their nucleic acid, that they will uh, destroy the host chromosome. They, they take over the cell to make um, their, own, their own products. Uh, but you can see here, this, this new bacteriophage that's being as, as, as assembled in, in the host cell, it's got the, the purple uh, DNA from the old bacteria cell. So it's inadvertently packaged some of the old bacteria cell instead of uh, DNA, instead of the, the viral DNA. Uh, and then it's when it bursts out of that bacteria cell, when it goes and infects another cell, uh, some viruses can do another kind of replication while they're at, they will actually integrate into the host DNA instead of just uh, up tear it apart. So uh, we call this a transduced cell because it's, it's, it has some DNA from this old bacteria cell. Uh, and like we said, we don't think that this, we don't have a lot of evidence. This happens a lot in nature, but we do know that there are some bacteria cells that only cause uh, an infection if they have uh, been infected with a bacteriophage. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, and then lastly, bacterial conjugation. Okay, so this is where uh, the bacteria is able to make an apelis and extend it to another bacteria cells. This is the only kind of horizontal gene transfer where both cells uh, remain alive. Okay, with both transformation and transduction, uh, the cell where the, the DNA came from is, is dead. Uh, and here we have the donor cell is an F plus cell because it has a fertility plasmid. And the recipient cell is uh, going to be F negative. Okay, so say this is the donor cell here and this is the recipient, uh, that pelis is extended. What the pelis does is actually bring the two cells close together. Uh, we don't think the DNA is actually exchanged through the pelis. We used to think that, we don't think that anymore. Uh, a pore opens up between the cells when they're close to each other. Uh, and then that F plasmid, that fertility plasmid is transferred from one cell to the other. All right, so here's maybe a, a little better drawing to help you understand what's going on. Uh, there's the pelis there between the two cells. Um, here's the F plasmid 
uh, in, the, in the F positive cell. Uh, that F plasmid is copied and then uh, the DNA is exchanged through a pore into the F negative cell. Uh, and now that cell becomes, uh, has that fertility plasmid. So hopefully you're thinking, well, so what, right? <laughs> like, okay, now it has this plasmid and it can share it with other cells. What, what good is that? Well, the so what here is that um, other plasmids uh, can be exchanged as well. Say, or transferred. Okay, so once a cell has that fertility plasmid and it can extend uh, its pelis, then it can copy other plasmids and exchange those as well, like maybe a resistance plasmid. So I think it, this is a really common way that bacteria cells will share their ability to be resistant to some antibiotic and that can spread in a population. Um, rarely a, a cell's chromosome can be copied and shared as well. Um, that's a little, we call that a high frequency recombination cell. Um, and that can ha happen sometimes, but uh, more often it's just gonna involve the plasmid. Okay. Last thing that I wanna mention here is one other way that not only bacteria, but lots of different organisms can share their DNA, uh, including humans. We think this happens in humans as well, where remember the other uh, horizontal gene transfer is just in prokaryotes, uh, is by transposition. And we have kind of a lot of names for transposition. Uh, sometimes we call these transposable elements. Uh, sometimes we call them uh, jumping genes. And these were discovered by Barbara McClintock when she was doing research uh, with corn back in the 1940s. Um, and apparently these are pretty widespread. Even humans, um, they, are, they are segments of DNA that can actually move to another place in the same strand of DNA uh, or another place in another strand of DNA or even possibly into another cell, okay? So they, they show that here. Uh, it's kind of oh, it's kind of small the way that it came up there. Um, so they show this here. This transposable element can move from one place on the chromosome to another. Sometimes that's a simple cut one place and paste another place. Sometimes that transposable element will copy itself and it will insert in many different places. So you can see that here, it's going off into lots of different spots in the chromosome. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, pasted into a plasmid and those plasmids then can be more easily shared to other cells. So what is a transposon? Uh, <laughs> Basically, the simplest kind of transposon uh, is a segment of DNA that has inverted repeats on either side of the gene. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit. This is one of the two ways that transcription can terminate. One way involves that row protein. The other involves some inverted sequences uh, that kind of fold back on each other and cause some mechanical strain that causes the RNA transcript. Uh, transcripts to come apart from the DNA. Uh, you'll see here, so what do I mean by inverted, inverted repeat? Uh, this A here, this is complementary to that T. So this T complementary here. So this would fold up on itself and be complementary. Um, and then the, the gene there is for transposase. That's just for an enzyme that does the cutting of the segment and then inserting somewhere else. Okay, so that's, that's the simplest transposon. Um, here you can kind of imagine how, here's the insertion sequence or the transposon, uh, and then here's the enzyme that's made transposase. It maybe brings one segment of the DNA closer to, to another segment, 
Uh, and here it's actually copied that insertion sequence and we still have the original one. So sometimes it copies, sometimes it cuts and pastes. Um, so yeah, it's just another way to introduce genetic variability. Um, a more complex com transposon uh, can also have other genes other than just that transposase gene, like, hey, maybe resistance to some antibiotic. So another way that perhaps uh, the information for a cell to survive in the presence of antibiotics can, can spread um, to other genes, even to other cells. So if you took microbial genetics, I'm sure that you would talk a lot more about transposons, but that's, that's pretty much what I want you to know about those. So, all right, any questions? Okay, so that that is the material for for Monday's exam. Oops. Oh, we already did that. Okay, there we go. All right, so so we'll move on. I will say that a lot of students find the metabolism and the genetics probably the most rigorous part of the semester. Um, we're starting some information that's just a little bit more cut and dried and maybe a little bit more applicable, a little bit more tangible. Uh, it gets a little bit more difficult again when we get to the immunology near the end of the semester. Uh, but we'll be talking about viruses today and our next time together. And then we'll start thinking about um, basically ways to kill microbes. <laughs> Uh, as, way, as well as the use of antibiotics. So that gets pretty applicable. Uh, and of course, thinking about viruses in the last few years, like everybody's been thinking about viruses. So hopefully you uh, learn some things uh, that's again, applicable to decisions that you have to make every day. All right, so we'll start with kind of an overview, different characteristics of viruses, how we classify them, um, how they replicate. Um, a little bit on how to grow them in the lab and also something else really small that can kill you a prion. Okay, so we'll talk about what prions are. Um, and I like to just, uh, I can't remember, I think I did post this. Um, you know, we think of viruses, you know, we think of, oh, they're bad. Like you've probably had more than one viral infection on this list, uh, not to memorize, uh, just to show you, there's a lot of viruses out there that would do us harm. Um, and they range from things that you might even know that you're sick from them to viruses that would kill you every time, like rabies. Um, so, you know, and, and that's not a comprehensive list. Ebola is not on there. COVID-19 is not on there. Um, so I kind of, I think it was last semester, I was kind of thinking, well, there must be something good that I could say about viruses. You know, of course, we talk a lot about how bad bacteria are, but, you know, we could, we would not be healthy if we didn't have bacteria in our body. Uh, bacteria are, you know, decomposers, like it's, it's kind of obvious that, well, maybe not obvious, but they are necessary for us, for, for our life. Viruses, it's harder to make that argument. Um, so I looked up, here's an article, if you're interested, it's a kind of review article um, uh, of ways that maybe viruses benefit humans. Um, it talks about how viruses have the potential to be developed as useful biologics. Basically, how we can maybe manipulate viruses a little bit to help us be healthier. So. Um, you know, one thing that we've seen in the last few years, we have modified some viruses and used them as vaccine um, ways to deliver vaccines into our body. So uh, that's one way that they've been helpful. Um, there's potential for viruses, either natural viruses or ones that we monkeyed with in the lab a little bit uh, to be used to kill cancer tumors, potentially. Uh, maybe to treat genetic diseases or as a gene therapy tool. Uh, and we know that there are viruses that will kill bacteria. So they've actually uh, 
been used to treat bacterial infections for about 100 years. Uh, more so in other places of the world, like in Europe, more so than what we've used here. But, you know, that's a potential thing that, hey, if antibiotics kind of uh, are not working for us, maybe we can get some viruses to work for us instead. So uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, don't, don't memorize those. Uh, I also just, this is the slide that I inserted three years ago now. Uh, so 2020, February 2020, and I remember saying, oh, there's this interesting thing going on in China. Uh, people have died from this, this new infection. What's, what's, what's happening with this? This is kind of interesting. At that time, they called it uh, 2019N or novel coronavirus. Uh, and I, every semester, I kind of update the numbers here. I don't know how much longer that I'll be doing that. Uh, but as of, you know, last week, worldwide, over 6 million deaths, U.S. deaths, uh, over a million. Uh, the death rate has really slowed down. I think there was um, only like 200,000 more than when I had taught this six months ago. Um, the case number, I, I don't know how they're, re they're not really report, people are reporting that. So I don't know how they know that exactly. That's got to be just kind of a wild guess. Um, but uh, I was kind of looking, kind of searching around, where, where are we at with this? Uh, and according to the World Health Organization, the WHO, uh, they said that the virus has not stabilized into changing in predictable ways. So there is still the potential that we could get a, uh, a mutation that would get this virus, uh, you know, we get a, a variation of the virus that you know, the, our, all our vaccines uh, haven't done, won't do any good. So there's still potential there. Of course, hopefully that, that won't happen and it will maybe continue to mutate into something that, you know, we have immunity to or to something that's not as dangerous for us. But uh, it's, it's still a serious threat. Nobody really wants to talk about it anymore, but it's, it's still out there. Um, you know, other, other viruses like Ebola virus, uh, remember teaching during that, what do they call that, an pandemic, it's more of an epidemic, but you know, like 7,000 people died from that. We thought that was really horrendous, but that's, that's a uh, scanning, I think a scanning electron micrograph could be transmission, it's hard to tell, of the Ebola virus. Uh, this is, this is coronavirus. Uh, I've had that on there for years and years ever since I started teaching. I said, hey, you know, viruses can be really serious or they can cause things like the common cold and not be so serious. Uh, this is a electron micrograph of a bacteriophage. They, they, they kind of look, uh, some of them look more like a lunar lander or like an insect almost. So we got some really strange shapes. Uh, but whatever kind of virus it is, it's, it's really small. How small is it? Nice comparisons here uh, to a red blood cell and an E. coli. Of course, we've talked about how bacteria are in general about a micron big and they're anywhere from 10 to 100 times smaller than some eukaryotic cell. Uh, these little dots here, those, those are viruses in relation to an E. coli. So the, the biggest virus, smallpox is one of the bigger viruses. It's certainly the best known large virus. Um, still smaller, still way smaller than an E. coli. Uh, the smallest virus, I think polio virus is one of the smallest ones and it's pretty close to the same size as a bacterial ribosome. Okay, so we, we measured those certainly in, in nanometers but not micrometers. Okay, so uh, what other characteristics do we see with viruses? Uh, we call them acellular pathogens. I think I've used that term before. That just means that they, that they are not like a cell. They might have some things in common with cells, but they don't, for instance, have cell walls. Uh, they don't have organelles. They don't have anything that a normal cell would have. Uh, we also describe them as obligate intracellular parasites. Uh, parasite just meaning that they're living at the expense of another cell. 
um, and they have to live inside another cell. So obligate, they have to live inside another cell in order for them to be able to reproduce. Okay, so we are not growing viruses in the lab on nutrient auger, right? We, we need to grow them inside a living cell. Now, there are some bacteria that actually have to grow inside a living cell as well, but this is, you know, kind of unique for viruses, or it's not unique for viruses, but all viruses have to be inside a living cell. They will either have a DNA or an RNA genome. Okay, they're not going to have both. Uh, now, they could like transiently be making RNA from DNA, for example, but um, that, that virus, when it leaves the host cell, it's either going to have one or the other. <coughs> um, and if we're going to kind of co correctly use our terminology, uh, when a virus is outside of its host cell, we would correctly call it a virion. And sometimes I might slip and not use that correctly. But uh, and then when it's inside its host cell, that's when we would call it a virus. So we'll see when it's outside of the cell. Like like here's an example of a virion. It's there's the nucleic acid. Uh, there's a protein coat around that. It might have a membrane around it. Okay, that's 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 the virion. If that virion were to enter a host cell. Um, Pretty quickly, everything would fall away except for the nucleic acid. So we'll, we'll see that. Um, whether it's DNA or RNA, that genome is going to be surrounded uh, by a protein capsid. Okay, so you can see that over here. That's the kind of yellow fluffy things around. I'm not sure which kind of, oh, it says uh, adenovirus. Okay. Uh, around that virus, uh, and then the, the, that uh, protein capsid is going to be composed or made up of capsomeres, um, just uh, individual units of protein, lots, lots, of caps, lots of capsomeres come together to make the capsid, all right? And that's gonna protect the nucleic acid Uh, and then sometimes some viruses will be enclosed by a phospholipid bilayer membrane. Um, we call that the envelope. Some viruses don't have an envelope. Uh, they, some are, say, non enveloped. Uh, or sometimes we use the term naked. That just means that they don't have this, this membrane surrounding them. Okay, so if we look at that, that viral envelope, that membrane, uh, a few things about that. Uh, it's very common uh, for viruses that infect animals or of course, humans were, were an animal, common uh, in viruses that infect animals. Um, there are some exceptions to that uh, in terms of, you know, viral infections that um, will enter our host cells, not all and have an envelope, but it's just common that they do. Um, mostly bacteriophage do not have an envelope. Um, they're going to be acquired from the host. Okay, so um, we'll talk more about this, but either they're going to pull off that membrane, most likely from the plasma membrane of the host cell, or just take it with, it, with them, uh, sometimes from the nuclear membrane, actually. Okay, but again, it's, it's, the same composition of the plasma membrane of, of regular cells. Uh, there may be some glycoprotein spikes either in that envelope or if, if it's a virus that doesn't have an envelope, you might see the spikes just attached to the capsid. Here with the influenza virus, we're going to talk more about what those spikes do later on in the semester. 
Uh, and by the way, I should mention, I'm gonna talk about lots of different kinds of viruses. Um, they're just examples. Um, we will talk specifically about certain viruses kind of at the end of the semester, last couple of weeks. Uh, so for now, they're just examples. Don't memorize like any particular virus. Just think about the principle that I'm trying to, to illustrate. Uh, influenza virus, though, has, has a lot of spikes uh, on the outside stuck in its envelope. Uh, COVID-19 has spikes as well. It's very common. Those spikes are going to aid in host cell recognition. A lot of viruses are really specific, and they have to uh, infect a certain kind of host cell. Uh, oftentimes, they're necessary for attachment and entry as well. Uh, there are some viruses that don't have spikes, and in that case, there would be proteins embedded in the capsid or embedded in the membrane that would recognize a certain kind of cell. Uh, and typically, one other point to make here, typically um, enveloped viruses are going to degrade pretty quickly in the environment. Now that enveloped, so you might, people have asked me, well, what good is the envelope then? Probably the envelope helps the virus, um, maybe when it's inside of a host, maybe kind of fight off some of the host immune responses a little bit easier. But outside, like a virus on some surface, like a desktop or computer keyboard or on a, on a doorknob, um, if it's an envelope virus, it's going to dry out really quickly. When that envelope degrades, then the virus is not going to be able to infect a cell. Um, so when they first came out and said, oh, COVID-19, leave your, leave your groceries in the garage for three days in case you know, somebody else has touched them that has COVID-19, it just didn't seem right to me because uh, COVID-19 is an envelope virus and typically, you know, well, Flu is kind of the exception that it can stay viable for about a day on surfaces, but typically not much more than that. Um, now, something like norovirus, uh, if you've had norovirus, you probably remember it. It's really nasty. You're coming out both ends. Um, that one is not an envelope virus, so it's not, it does not have an envelope. So uh, you, you can have... <laughs> really outbreaks, you know, go through a cruise ship or a school really easily because when those contaminate a surface, they stay viable for a long time, uh, weeks. So um, that they're, it's just harder to kill and you have to get rid of them with bleach and everything like that. So uh, if it's a naked virus, it's going to be kind of tougher in the environment where uh, tougher than an envelope virus. Uh, okay, so um, still thinking about kind of generalities of different viruses, we see lots of different shapes of viruses, so we can uh, classify them in really only a couple of different ways. Um, we, we kind of classify them by the shape of their capsid. So, so there's really only helical and polyhedral, and then if the virus has an envelope around it, it, it will kind of take on a little bit different shape. Uh, and then anything that's really not helical or polyhedral, we, we throw into another category that we just call complex. All right, so some examples here, uh, a helical capsid, it's just kind of a long, thin capsid that's going to uh, be around the, the genome. Uh, one example, tobacco mosaic virus, these long, thin, kind of stick-like viruses. Um, Influenza virus has a helical capsid, but it's enveloped, so they look kind of round and squishy. <laughs> okay. uh, a polyhedral capsid uh, is, is another, is, is the other really common capsid variety. Um, I tried to look up uh, what if, are there different polyhedrons? Uh, the, I couldn't find any viruses that had anything other than icosahedral symmetry. So an icosahedron has 20 sides. It's a polygon with 20 sides. Uh, and this seems to be the most popular polyhedral capsid because uh, it has really good strength 
and stability because you've got 20 equilateral triangles that make up that shape. Okay, so really high symmetry, um, high strength and stability, so good protection for that uh, virus's nucleic acid. Uh, so here's an example of, of that icosahedral symmetry. And then, of course, you have enveloped polyhedral, something, this is a mock-up of a herpes virus. Uh, herpes, as we'll talk about later in the semester, bring in some other proteins with it. They have what's called a tegument kind of inside of their mem membrane, but um, that, that's not a common thing. That's just mostly, I think there might be a few other viruses other than herpes that have it, but it's kind of unique to herpes virus. Uh, and then kind of a catch-all for the viruses that don't fit into those helical or polyhedral categories, we just call them complex. So uh, one example, this, this is smallpox. You can see the caps in here. I don't even know what shape you would call that, a dumbbell, maybe just kind of this weird shape. Sometimes rabies is considered complex shape as more of a bullet shape. Uh, the virion is more of a bullet shape. Uh, we could call bacteriophages complex as well because they have this, uh, what's called a spindle and these tail fibers. And, and you might notice here that the polyhedron here is kind of elongated. So the, the triangles there, that's not a equilateral triangle, it's more of an isosceles triangle. So it's kind of a elongated head as well. All right, uh, and this seems like a good time to mention that uh, we're talking about general characteristics of viruses that most of the time viruses are pretty specific. Like they need a certain kind of host cell uh, and they don't, they don't just infect any cell. They're really specific for a certain kind of cell. Um, and even, even viruses that are unique to humans, it's usually a certain kind of tissue. Like we could swallow HIV and it wouldn't get us sick. Okay, they, so that human immunodeficiency virus has to uh, be near a, just a certain kind of R cells in order to be able to infect it. Um, so that's not always true. Like the tobacco mosaic virus, uh, shown here, there's a tobacco plant there that's showing a little yellowing due to the tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus. That virus can actually infect some other related plants, like uh, tomato plants, apparently, um, or petunias, apparently. Um, but we do know that a lot of bacteriophages are really specific. Uh, there's, there's certain bacteriophage that will only infect E. coli or only a certain strain of E. coli even. So this cell is in trouble. You can see lots and lots of bacteriophage on the outside there. Um, and, and this picture, the, the little, little pink circles, that's HIV attached to a white blood cell. Now, uh, there, are, there are viruses that will infect a lot of different hosts. We call those generalists. Um, again, that's not very common. Even coronavirus, typically, uh, now, you know, we've seen COVID-19 that's infected some tigers at a zoo or infected some pets, for instance. Uh, we think that that's not common uh, for a virus to jump species like that. Um, when they do, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> Uh, like a lot of animal animals have herpes virus, but the the herpes virus of animals doesn't infect humans. Like they usually stay species specific. Something like West Nile, uh, although can can infect a lot of different kinds of birds, uh, a lot of different kinds of animals, humans. So there are some generalists out there. Uh, let's see. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, the the genetic material of viruses. So I said the nucleic acid can either be DNA or RNA. So, and it can be double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA, which we talked about, we don't see single-stranded DNA anywhere else in nature, uh, or it can be RNA and it can be double-stranded RNA, which like I said, we don't see that anywhere else or single-stranded RNA. 
Um, that nucleic acid can either be circular or linear. Uh, and if it's linear, it can be either segmented Uh, or non-segmented. Okay, so in, in this picture up here of some virion, you can see the nucleic acid are those little red sticks uh, in, in the center there. Um, that's, that's a segmented genome. There's, uh, looks like actually six different segments. Um, coronavirus is non-segmented. There's just one huge long piece of RNA. It's got the longest RNA genome of, of any RNA virus. Okay. Uh, we do know that the gene number is small. Uh, so just for comparison purposes, before we sequenced the home, human genome, we thought there was probably hundreds of thousands or even more genes. Uh, now we know that number is a lot smaller, somewhere between 25 to 40,000 genes uh, for humans. E. coli, an order of magnitude less, uh, about 4,000 genes, makes sense, it's a simpler organism. If you take the virus with the smallest genome, we know that the hepatitis B virus only carries four genes with it. Um, now there, there are some like herpes virus has 100 to 200. So there are some that are larger than that. But uh, when you think about that, it makes sense because what a virus does, it enters the host cell and then it just takes over all the host cell machinery and it just uses all the host cell stuff. Um, the analogy that, that I've used before that some of you have heard, uh, sometimes I call my son a hepatitis B virus because he came home from fall break one year uh, he was coming home for four days and he brought his laptop and a football to play catch with his dad. I said, where's the rest of your stuff? <laughs> he said, I didn't bring anything else. Uh, and I thought later, I thought, well, he didn't really need it. So he had a bed and sheets and towels and food and an extra toothbrush and old clothes. He didn't really need it. So he's just like a, a virus that, again, takes over the whole cell. Um, and he doesn't get mad when I call him that, but uh, somebody said, why do you call me that again? I have to explain it to him, but okay, so, so it makes sense. Uh, and we'll talk about what some of those spe specific genes are that a virus really needs that, to bring with it that the whole cell doesn't have. So we'll talk about a few of those uh, as we move forward. Uh, as far as classifying viruses, um, there's a couple of different ways that we do that. Um, one way seems a lot more simple, and we call this the Baltimore classi classification. Uh, and whoops, I ran out of room there. Classification. Um, this David Baltimore came up with that. David Baltimore did a lot of research on HIV AIDS uh, back in back in the 80s. So he figured out his he said, hey, this is this is a simple way to classify viruses. And it's just based on the nucleic acid of the virus. So there's not really any argument here. Um, and, and you don't have to memorize this. I don't have this memorized, but Class one, for example, uh, all the double-stranded DNA viruses are class one, Baltimore class one. Uh, Single-stranded DNA are Baltimore class two. Um, and then th it makes a difference uh, for the single-stranded RNA viruses, whether they have plus sense R RNA or minus sense. Uh, we're gonna walk through the difference there. Um, there is some crazy stuff that goes on, like there are some single-stranded plus sense RNA viruses that uh, actually go through a DNA intermediate to make more RNA. We call those retroviruses. Uh, and there are double-stranded DNA viruses that don't just replicate their DNA. They go, have to go through an RNA intermediate to replicate their DNA. So there are some kind of crazier things that go on. Uh, the other kind of viral uh, classification system uh, we call the hierarchical. Uh, and this is the older classification system. Uh, 
with this system, it, it has its problems because essentially what we're trying to do is act like viruses are living organisms and classify the same way that we do other living organisms. Uh, we're gonna talk about whether we consider them alive or not. Most people would say no, but there is some kind of wiggle room in there to make an argument. Uh, but uh, we, come in, we come into problems because again, they don't have the cellular structure, but again, we, we put them in things like orders and families and genera, just like we do living organisms. So with this classification system, there's seven orders and, and all viruses are put in families. Uh, and those family names end with the suffix viridae. So for instance, herpes viridae, that's the family that all the herpes viruses are in. Um, and it's correct to uh, italicize viral family names as well as genuses. Um, then the genera are gonna carry the suffix virus. Okay? So like herpes virus. Okay? Uh, the species gets a little bit tricky um, I didn't I didn't write that down there, but oftentimes uh, we consider the species of a virus the disease it causes. So, for example, I wrote down an example here uh, in the family Bunyaviridae. There is a genus Lebovirus that causes the, the infection Rift Valley fever. So then the species would be Rift Valley fever virus. Okay. If you go to the CDC, there's a, they have a website, there's um, uh, a section on naming viruses. It's like 30 pages long. <laughs> uh, and we're constantly kind of changing what we think is correct. Uh, there's an international committee that decides on these things. So it's kind of complicated. Um, what kind of characteristics do we use to make these different, different classes? Uh, you know, we look at the nature of the nucleic acid and the shape of the capsid and whether there's an envelope, uh, how big it is. Also some genetic analysis and some sequencing as well. So we look at kind of all those different characteristics and try to put them into groups. Uh, so uh, I just, I just post, I can't remember if I posted this or not. This is just a hey, this is all the different uh, things that we've talked about here, ways that we classify viruses um, based on their nucleic acid, what kind of symmetry of capsid, whether they are naked or enveloped, whether the genome is segmented or continuous, is what they call it here, rather than segmented or unsegmented. Um, the Baltimore class is right there. You get a sense of the different shapes uh, of, of some viruses and then the family name and how many genes we think there are, things like that. So just sort of to kind of, again, appreciate the diversity there and some of the things that we use. I think that I would rather wait and start viral replication after your exam. So uh, we'll pick up there next week. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can come see me. Remember, I have office hours, a lot of office hours tomorrow and Friday. If you want to come see me, show up or make another time. Don't get blown away by the wind. I mean, yes. I have a hard time opening the syllabus.